All right, folks. We talked about Nixon resigning last time. We talked about Nixon resigning. And so Nixon, write down. Nixon will ultimately resign from office. Uh, here he is writing a letter to the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, saying, I hereby resign the office of the President of the United States. Have you watched the video already of him resigning? Yeah. yeah. yeah he's, he's like, oh, yeah, it's really quick, guys. Don't worry. So he's going to do this thing, and he goes in front of the entire American public. And I resign. So he resigns. <laughs> There's more of it, but that's pretty much the gist of it. He resigns from office. He, I mean, he wants to resign and like, you know, like, I'm doing what's best for America. He's saying, what he said in his resignation speech was, Congress is going to be, you know, distracted by this impeachment, and they may or may not find any evidence of any wrongdoing, and I will be on trial, and I won't be able to do my job, and Congress doesn't trust me whether or not I did or did not do anything illegal. And so, ultimately, folks, I have to resign. And eventually, he says... Uh, I did it, and he steps down, and he steps out of the limelight for a very long time. That's like, you know how you haven't seen George W. Bush in a while? He does the same, he kind of just goes out of the limelight. A few years later, he's interviewed by David Frost, who is a, uh, I guess a talk show host, the best way to describe him, uh, in England, and it's supposed to be just a clean interview about, you know, kind of what happened, you know, with your presidency, what did you like, highs and lows, and David Frost was told pretty explicitly uh, not to talk about the Watergate scandal. Now, you know, Nixon will come, but don't, don't ask him about it, you're not supposed to, that was the agreement. But David Frost really wanted to ask him about, because that was the question everyone wanted to know about. They wanted Nixon talking about Watergate. And so Nixon eventually, near the end of the interview, starts to apologize. And this is the first time Nixon ever publicly apologized for the Watergate scandal. Here's that apology. It's kind of a big deal. I'm sorry. I just hope I have not to let you down. Well, I said I just hope I have not let you down. That's not all. I have. I let down my friends. I let down. The country. I let down our system of government, dreams of all those young people who are in the government who think it's all too corrupt and the rest. Most of all, I let down opportunity that I would have had for two and a half more years to proceed on three projects and programs. openly apologized for it, which is a big deal. Because up until that point, people always wondered if Nixon felt guilty about it or not, because he never talked about it. And so he finally does openly apologize. And David Frost, you see him there, he just like, doesn't know what to do. He's like, oh my God, he's actually apologizing for the, for the scandal. Because he did, it was kind of like a, there's a movie, Frost Nixon, there's also a play about the Frost Nixon, the base called Frost Nixon. Um, but it was, it was kind of like a it was a game between the two of like, how can I ask him questions about the Watergate thing without actually asking him questions about Watergate? And when he finally does kind of open up about the whole thing, it was a big deal for America to see. And so uh, that was a huge point for America. Nonetheless, uh, Gerald Ford does replace Nixon, becoming the 38th president of the United States. And as I said previously, the only president never to be elected president because he was appointed after Spiro Agnew resigned. So he's the only president never to be elected president. Also, fun fact, uh, Gerald Ford used to be a, I think, high school and also college football player, and he used to be a male model. Yeah. Yep, so that, that was the thing. <laughs> 
Uh, one of the first things that Ford does is Ford pardons Nixon. Here he is pardoning Nixon. So what does it mean when Ford pardons Nixon? What does that mean? Okay, so forgives him, but what does that mean in a legal sense? Yeah, he doesn't have to what? He doesn't have to go to jail or go to trial. So that was a big deal, folks. The reason why we pardoned Nixon is that we didn't want to have to deal with a president going on trial. Because would that really hurt the morale of America, to see our president on trial for crimes. And so the major reason why Ford pardons Nixon is, again, we didn't want to see a president on trial. That was a major concern for a lot of us, seeing a president on trial. But the other fear was that if our president was on trial, who might be able to use that image against us? Yeah, the Soviets. You know, the idea that, oh, look, America's you know, governments are corrupt and their president is on trial for corruption, we didn't want to have to deal with that. And so we tried to avoid uh, this trial as best we could. So again, Ford pardons Nixon. Other things that Ford did? We passed something called whip inflation now, or win. This is not too creative. Uh, I think FDR did the same thing several years back, and Truman did as well. But the whole point was to fight what? Inflation, rapid inflation. Whip inflation now was intended to fight rapid inflation. We're supposed to fight rapid inflation. Whip inflation now to fight rapid inflation. Cool. OK. In terms of international foreign stuff, uh, he did sign what became known as the Helsinki Accords. This is all part of detente. It could still easing tensions. Uh, so this is a part of detente that he inherited from Nixon. But he signed something called the Helsinki Accords. And the Helsinki Accords were designed to promote what? For every human being. Human rights. So the whole point of the Helsinki Accords was to promote and protect human rights. To promote and protect human rights. Because were there countries out there that were not promoting human rights? Yeah, some people killing their own people. And so that was definitely something that we wanted to make sure that we were tackling, protecting or promoting human rights. Helsinki Accords. Eventually in 76, Ford will get renominated by the Democratic or Republican Party. And the Democrats will nominate Jimmy Carter. Fun fact about Jimmy Carter, he was a peanut farmer. He eventually became president. So the peanut farmer versus the male model. <laughs> Clash of the colossals. Colossal candidates. What platform was he running on? Well, the basic idea, I mean, who, Carter? Carter was running on a platform that you know, he was a man of the people, that we were tired of the corruption of the Nixon administration. Ford was probably complicit in that. Yeah. So, I mean, Ford inherited the bad corruption press of the Republican Party the previous year. So Carter gets elected. Ford wasn't a bad president, but he wasn't a good president. He's, yeah, he was, he's a forgettable president, you know? I'm like, yeah, he, remember, he was appointed. He was never elected. And so even when he tried to run, he wasn't going to get too much done. Okay. 
They also served only two years. So. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty close vote, guys. Uh, but Carter does win here in 76, 297 to 240. It didn't split, but uh, Reagan, uh, who was a Republican, he tried to run independently uh, because he was unhappy that he didn't get the nomination of his party. So he tried to run anyway as an independent Republican, and he didn't win this election. Carter becomes the 39th president of the United States, serving from 1976 to 1980. He didn't get reelected. No. He did not. He's still alive today, though. He's very involved today still. He did not have a very good presidency. Um, a lot of it was he. He made a lot of promises that were just impossible to keep. And so, I mean, it was all like all well-meaning, like I will save all people, we'll make sure that everyone is rich, and eventually these all become false promises. You know, like, by the end of this class, guys, you guys will all be millionaires. Woo! I'm not gonna win re-election, you know, it's yeah. just not gonna happen. Um, but some of the good things that he did do, he created the Department of Energy. Um, today, this regulates all forms of energy, atomic, nuclear, coal, gas, uh, solar, wind. But originally, the Department of Energy was designed to regulate what really important fuel source that we were concerned about, oil. It was originally designed to regulate oil or gasoline because it was definitely something that we were constantly running out of, or at least we needed to regulate because were we becoming more dependent on gasoline as a country? Yeah, so that's why it was regulates all of our energy, but primarily it was initially created to regulate oil. Then he created Superfund. Not to be confused with the Super Friends, which is the 1970s version of the Justice League. Superfund was a fund to clean up chemical waste dumps. The Superfund was designed to clean up chemical waste dumps. What happened, folks, was that a lot of companies were just taking their chemicals, just dumping them into rivers, lakes, like, you know, dumps and whatever else. Uh, and the problem was, what would eventually happen to those canisters? They would rot, break open, all those chemicals would seep into the water, the environment, the rivers, the lakes, the streams, the aqueducts. And so the Superfund was supposed to clean up these chemical waste dumps. Uh, one really good example is when Three Mile Island, it was a nuclear power plant, uh, had a partial meltdown. They had to clean up that entire area because it was radiated, so it was a problem. Chernobyl? Uh, they used graphite to uh, cool their rods and the graphite melted. It's not supposed to happen. The graphite has too low of a melting point, and so that became a problem. There was a nuclear meltdown, uh, pressure built up, it exploded. Not good. Mm, a lot of people got sick. I mean, yeah, people got killed, but a lot of people got sick. In any case, let's talk about uh, Carter's foreign policy. Carter's foreign policy really revolved on this idea of human rights. You know, he wanted to make sure that everyone's rights were protected. So he criticized all countries for human rights violations. Or he criticized countries for human rights violations. He didn't criticize all countries. He criticized countries for human rights violations. He criticized countries for human rights violations. And he criticized countries for human rights violations. And at the same time, he would not criticize American allies with human rights violations. So he would criticize countries with human rights violations except American allies. Not France and England, they didn't have human rights violations. More like the Philippines and South Korea. Remember how South Vietnam, no Din Diem, was killing his people? And we kind of just turned a blind eye to that? We were still doing that. But if it wasn't our friend, like if it was Cuba, like Cuba, you're killing your own people. But if the Philippines is killing its own people, are we going to say anything about it? Because they're our dictator. They're our ally. So again, one really good example was the Philippines was under uh, military rule for quite some time, martial law. And we were cool with that. 
because they were our ally. Nonetheless, folks, uh, he is criticized for this for having a hypocritical foreign policy because he would criticize foreign policy in some countries or human rights policies in some countries, but not others. So that became a problem. Two good things that he did do, foreign policy-wise, uh, was he signed the Panama Canal Treaty, which gave the Panama Canal back to Panama in 1999. He gave the Panama Canal so the back to. Years, he gave the Panama Canal back to Panama in 1999. The argument that I've heard since then is that um, the Panama Canal has been poorly run by the Panamanians, and many people miss the Americans running the Panama Canal. In any case, yeah. When I went to the Panama Canal, I went this way. Whoops. I went that way. My parents are going to go on the Panama Canal soon. They're going to go this way. My way was better. <laughs> Same thing. It doesn't really make a difference. But. The other thing that he did was he signed or he was able to negotiate a peace with the Camp David Accords. And the Camp David Accords was a negotiated peace treaty between what two important Middle Eastern countries? Israel. And Egypt. Very good. Israel and Egypt. So it was a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. That's a big deal, folks. Put a big star next to that one. A star of David, if you will. <laughs> Egypt and Israel. This is a big deal, folks, because is Egypt a powerful country in the Middle East? No. Yes, and if they sign a peace treaty with Israel, the only non-Arab country in the Middle East, uh, then I guess that's not true. Iran is a non-Arab country. They're a Persian country. Anyway, not important. But yeah, it's a big deal when they sign this treaty. Good so far? Cool. Then Iran hostage crisis happened, and he screwed it up, so not so good. So yeah, this is a big failure for uh, Carter, failing the Iranian hostage crisis. So the Iran hostage crisis was a failure for Carter. Even though no one died, they were in prison for 444 days, and that's not good. Hmm? The American hostages in Iran? Yeah, go watch Argo. Amazing. Yep. With regard to the Cold War, folks, a few things that happened. Well, Carter and the Cold War, a few things that happened here. Number one, he signed SALT II. What do you think that did? It limited nuclear weapons again, so it limited nuclear weapons. Limited nuclear weapons. And then something bad happened in 1979. The Soviets invaded Afghanistan. So our response to this invasion that we did not support, obviously, was what did America do? Nope. We didn't do anything in Afghanistan. Well, what did we do? America boycotted the 1980 Moscow Olympics, which was held in Russia. So we boycotted the 1980 Moscow Olympics because Russia was holding the Olympics that year and they invaded Afghanistan. They said, nope, not going to go. That's messed up, man. So imagine if you were a gymnast or an athlete that was training for four years only to be told, oh, yeah, you're not going to the Olympics this year. We as a country are boycotting the Olympics. So a lot of people were pretty upset about that. But again, it was a show of force saying, look, I mean, we don't approve of what you are doing here. It's a sham to say you're a country of freedom and, you know, and goodwill, and then you invade another country. So America did not show up. And that year, many countries that had never meddled before meddled because America did not participate in the Olympics, <laughs> which is true. So in the election of 1980, Reagan is nominated by the Republicans. Carter is nominated by the Democrats. 
Reagan is naturally going to win here because he is a television personality. He was a movie star. And uh, he was also eventually the governor of California. So Reagan will win here pretty handily against uh, Carter in the 1980 election. Hmm? Two? Nixon. So uh, Reagan wins here, beating Nixon, because uh, beating Carter, rather, because Carter had a pretty screwed up administration. 489 to 49. And Reagan becomes the next president of the United States, serving from 1980. Huh? Yes. Right. And this time he wins the nomination of his party. Mm -hmm. Two full terms. He's also the oldest person to ever be president of the United States. Uh, 70? Maybe 70? I forget. I want to say he was 70, but maybe younger than that. Maybe he was like 62. 80 to 88. Reagan wins because he is supported by a group known as the New Right. The New Right is also known as the Moral Majority. They're also known as the Christian Right. The basic idea is that they're the modern Republican Party today because they emphasize what should be in politics? Religion and God. So the Christian right, moral majority, the new right, this is the foundation of the modern Republican Party. And they're led by Jerry Falwell, who is a uh, minister who says that God should be infused in America. Again, the argument that one nation under God, remember, if you don't believe in God, you're not a real American. This is where you start seeing that being promoted in America. Whereas our government is technically supposed to be what? Secular. The term is secular. What does secular mean? Separation of church and state. But that's a debate for another time. He also believed in Reaganomics, and the basic idea of Reaganomics is trickle down. Very good. Trickle down. You give money to who? The rich. Trickle down to the commoners. So trickle down is Reaganomics. It's the same thing. Everyone good there? Don't worry about this. Then the Challenger Space Shuttle, uh, 1979, I believe. Uh, this is the first teacher uh, won a contest to be on the ship, and it exploded. Yeah, as it was ascending. Students across the country were watching this because it was a big deal. We're trying to promote science education, and a teacher won the contest, and then it exploded. Uh, there was a malfunction in one of the fuel rockets, and so... There was a, there's a leak, it exploded, pressure built up, massive explosion. Tragedy, seven astronauts killed. Not good. In 1984, Reagan is reelected. Pretty easily. Only losing uh, Minnesota to Walter Mondale. Yep. And the following year, I was born pretty cool. Stay right there. Stay right there. That's pretty neat. Uh, that happened. And, <laughs> and that following year. That won't be on the AP test. Uh, and then Reagan's foreign policy is what we're talking about next. So that's what happened domestically in America. That's uh, <laughs> significant to Amer the American domestic policies. With regard to Reagan's foreign policy, though, in regard to the Cold War, one of Reagan's most important and iconic creations was Strategic Defense Initiative. And we will talk about SDI when I see you guys next time. Have a good day, folks. Be prepared for our final lecture. I mean, we'll still lecture, but it'll be the final new content lecture. See you later, folks.